More than a million people are being told right now to get out because of this. What you're looking at right now is a satellite image of the eve of Hurricane Florence, a potentially devastating Category 4 hurricane approaching the southeastern coast. Now from space, you can see what a monster storm this really is as it picks up strength and heads for coastal areas in North Carolina, South Carolina and Virginia. We're going to have a lot on Hurricane Florence, obviously, in this hour. It's important uh, that you know about it. We're going to tell you how people are getting ready, the evacuation orders, the danger of the storm surges that are expected, big storm surges. The National Hurricane Center has just released its latest advisory on Florence. Our meteorologist, uh, Jennifer Gray, joins us now from the CNN Weather Center in Atlanta with the latest. So uh, talk to me about what you've just learned. Well, basically no change from the 5 o'clock advisory. This is still a very powerful Category 4 storm with winds of 140 miles per hour, gust of 165, moving to the west-northwest at 17 miles per hour. This storm is very strong. It is very symmetrical, and it is going to cause destruction wherever this makes landfall. It's going to remain a Category 4, but possibly increasing in strength by the time we get into tomorrow, remaining a Category 4, then possibly weak weakening just a little bit to a Category 3 right as it's making landfall sometime early on Friday. And then, Anderson, it is going to slow way down. So it's not just the coast that we're talking about here. Inland areas could be affected, a lot of flooding, even for days. You're exactly right. We talk about these storms. We talk about evacuate away, evacuate away from the coast, get away from the coast. With this storm, it's very different. You are going to have to go far inland and away from this storm to get a, away from all of the rain because it is going to dump 20 to 30 inches of rain across this area. Those are the watches and warnings. And look at this, that white area right along the coast, that's 20 or 30 inches of rain. But as you go very far inland, even western portions of North Carolina, we're talking about more than 10 inches of rain. So if you evacuate away from the coast and some of these inland locations, you could be inundated with rainfall. And this is a part of the country that is already extremely saturated. We have had a very, very wet year. And so any additional rainfall is going to be catastrophic, not to mention the storm surge that they're going to be facing. And just, just quick, in terms of the strength, how does this compare to past storms that we've seen on the East Coast? Well, a lot of people have been comparing this storm to Hugo back in 1989. The problem is the population has increased by about 25% since Hugo. We hate comparing storms because each storm is completely different. These are both very powerful storms, though. Uh, so it is a decent comparison. But with the population increase, the storm surge and the rain already on saturated ground, uh, the storm has the potential to be a lot worse. So, Jennifer, the idea that this may uh, become a, th a Cat 3 by the time it actually uh, makes landfall, I mean, that's obviously better than, than it being a 4. It's still an incredibly strong storm. Why might it it go down to a three. And is that new information? Because I remember yesterday Tom Sater talking about the possibility of the storm not being able to maintain itself as a four. Well, I, I think that the, basically because this storm is going to slow down so much, the steering currents for this storm are basically going to go away in the next three to five days. So this storm is going to sit right off the coast. And when it does that, it's going to continue to shred that coastline and start to weaken and tear apart just a little bit. And so it could still maintain a weak Category 4 strength uh, by the time it makes landfall. So it's either going to be a strong 3 or a low-end 4. But I really think, regardless of what it is, it is going to be devastating. And just one more thing. You said that you talked about it slowing down and slowing down on land. How many days are you talking about it being a presence in this entire region inland? We're still going to be talking about this storm Sunday, maybe even Monday. Wow. Um, some of the models are disagreeing as to where exactly it's going to go once it, it goes inland because it's going to slow so much. Um, some models are now taking it a little bit farther to the south. So places like South Carolina, even Georgia need to be on the lookout for this storm. Uh, but we're going to be talking about this well into the weekend, into the early part of next week. Wow. I mean, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, even Monday. Yeah. That's incredible. Jennifer Gray, thanks very much. Joining me now is Woody White, the board chairman of the new uh, Hanover County Commissioners in North Carolina. It's a county that includes Wilmington. Uh, Woody, there's a mandatory evacuation currently in, in place in parts of your county ahead of the storm. What are your top priorities going to be, say, in the last 24 hours before this hurricane hits? 
Well, Anderson, we've got a few of them. Our top priorities are just to continue to raise awareness to our citizens about the seriousness of the storm, and not just in one area, but in all areas of surge, potential flooding inland, and the wind speed. And getting that message out, not only to, to evacuate on your own if you can, but to take advantage of the resources that we've put in place to evacuate those that can't help themselves. And, and primarily those that are going to stay in the voluntary evacuation areas, think about your family first, think about your pets, think about the things that matter in life, and worry about your property later. We'll rebuild, things will be fine, but those are really the priorities and the messages that we're trying to push right now. You know, everyone focuses on people, well, just get, being able to get in their cars. Uh, there are folks who don't have access to vehicles. Yeah. What, what, uh, what, what options are there for people who don't have their own their own vehicles, who it's not just so easy for them to just get up and leave? Well, we have a local shelter first off. We also have an agreement with a school in Raleigh in Wake County. We ran our first bus today. There were 38 people on it. We're running two more buses tomorrow at 10 and 2, and we encourage folks that need to avail themselves of those resources to stay in touch with our local emergency management uh, hotline. Uh, and so we feel like we're fully prepared for that because the main threats, as your experts say, and as we all know from experiences that we've, we've seen and lived through, is in the surge areas and the high flood areas. There's nothing we can do about the wind necessarily. Uh, oftentimes, and more often than not, for that matter, people are safer in their own homes, if it's a nice home, a good home, a safe home, than they are out on the road or elsewhere. But there are exceptions to that. There are manufactured homes, there are people that that need to be in shelters, and for those folks, we have put those resources in place. How concerned are you about what seems to be the, you know, th this thing slowing down once it hits land uh, and, and making this an event which you know, w we were just talking uh, uh, could go on for days and days? It's frightening because we remember Floyd, we remember Matthew. Uh, I've been a victim of flooding myself in Matthew recently. It's disastrous and it, you know, the, the cameras, and which, by the way, we're thankful that you guys come down here and bring awareness to our community. I wish I were given a Chamber of Commerce speech about how awesome our community is during the tourist season. But when the cameras leave and the storm passes, when the flooding comes, it, it's, it stays with us for months, often years, and it devastates communities. And that's really something we're worried about. It's something we try to prepare for. But it, Mother Nature has a unique way of making every storm different and every storm more of a challenge than the last that it seems. But we'll be prepared and we're going to recover no matter how bad this is. Well, Woody White, I wish you the best and I appreciate all your efforts and we'll continue to check in with you in the, uh, the days ahead. I want to get more now on the damage this kind of hurricane can do, things we've seen in the past. Tom Foreman joins us now with, with that. Tom? Uh, Anderson, if this were a 100-mile-an-hour storm, sure, you'd lose some mobile homes, you'd lose some sheds, you'd have localized flooding, probably not a whole lot more. But when you start talking about 130 to 160 miles an hour, roughly, which is what we're talking about with these categories, look at the model. It's so different then. Now you're talking about winds that are strong enough to rip the roofs off of houses, to knock big trees down, to do a tremendous amount of damage out there. And when that happens, there's really nothing to do except try to get to a safe space if you possibly can because that damage is so devastating out there. And that's not counting the storm surge. When you start talking about a storm surge of 13 to 18 feet maybe, that's going to have a big impact, especially in this area. And let me explain why. Much of this part of the eastern seaboard is not really very high at all. If you look at this, if you had a storm surge of just 9 to 10 feet, everything in red here is going to be submerged. And that is an awful lot of people, Anderson. There's a lot of talk uh, about this hurricane possibly stalling on the coast, just sitting there instead of moving on inland. I was just talking uh, to our last guest about that. Can you explain uh, the, the difficulties that, that that's going to bring? Yeah, essentially you have a pincer effect. This is what Jennifer was talking about a little while ago. You have the water that's pushing in from the ocean, and it's piling up on shore. And at the same time, the inland rain is pushing water this way. And then you wind up with an indeterminate amount of water in some communities. And that storm surge really is where the damage comes. Look at the record. If you go back to Hurricane Ike in 2008, storm surge 15 to 20 feet, 
deaths, $103, $30 billion in damage. Of course, we all know about Katrina. You know it best, Anderson. Storm surge, 20 to 28 feet, more than 1,800 deaths, $128 billion worth of damage. And you made mention a little while ago about Hurricane Hugo, also on the East Coast. That was back in the late 80s. 20 feet storm surge, deaths, $59 billion in damage. And as we have noted, that's back when a whole lot fewer people were living in the bullseye as they are now. Yeah.